I am delighted to have the opportunity to sit down with Brighton and Hove's very own Norman Cook, also known as Fatboy Slim. He is one of the most internationally renowned DJs and in-demand performers and was an integral part of a music revolution in which he helped to popularize the big beat genre in the 1990s. He started out his music career in the House Martins in the 1980s, and after they disbanded, he went on to release music under various names up until 1996, when he became Fatboy Slim. He became famous for what are now iconic singles, like Praise You, Right Here, Right Now, and Weapon of Choice, released throughout the late 90s and early 2000s. He is adored by this city, and I think it's fair to say he's in love with us too. Ladies and gentlemen, we are thrilled to be in conversation this evening with Norman Cook and your host, me. So good evening, Norman. Good evening. Yay! <laughs> Thank you so much for coming to do In Conversation with me here at Rockwater. Well, thanks for having me. Thanks for, thanks for being interested. Yeah, very interested. Um, I've got reams of questions. Cool. So may I start at the beginning? Absolutely, great Thank place you. to start. You were born 31st of July in 1963 as Quinton Leo Cook known to many as Norman Quinton Cook, or Norman Cook, or to a lot as Fatboy Slim. So why did you change your name from Quentin to Norman? I changed my name from Quentin to Norman because uh, anybody of my age would know that in those days, pre-Quentin Tarantino, there was only one Quentin that anybody had heard of, and that was Quentin Crisp, who was England's most celebrated homosexual. Oh! Now, I've got nothing against homosexuals, but going through your whole school career just okay. named after the most famous one kind uh, of wore a bit thin so as soon as I got in a pop band and there's less chance to reinvent yourself I just thought the first thing I want to do is shake off that it was also pre-Quentin Tarantino no one could spell it remember it pronounce it and it was just it just it was one of my parents ideas in the 60s that they thought they'd be very cool and trendy. yeah but, no, yeah, I, I can understand that. And Norman, you've got Norman. No, I just wanted like a that. normal name. Yeah. I wanted a normal name. It was either going to be Ernie or Norman. It, it's sort of, I just want a normal old man's name, not one of these flowery, no. fancy names. No, Ernie and Norman, both good names. And then, so also, Fatboy Slim, where did, how, did that, how did that name come about whilst we're talking names? Fatboy Slim came, uh, basically, I just needed another alter ego. At that yeah. point, I was pizza man, I was a member of Freak Power, I was a member of the, dub, the Mighty Dubcats, and we just needed a another name. And we just did a sort of drunken brainstorming session where we just saw stupid names. I mean, technically, I really love old blues songs and old blues singers, and, um, and most of the old ones had really stupid names, like yeah. Snooks Eaglin and yeah. Arthur Big Boy Crudup and P.T. Wheatstraw and things. If you were a fat blues singer, you'd be called Slim, ironically. So there was Memphis Slim, Pine Top Slim, Bumblebee Slim, and Fatboy Slim was this sort of oxymoronic blues singer who couldn't exist. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, cool. And it just had a good ring to it. It doesn't mean anything. No, cool. Um, and also... Apart from I am an, a walking oxymoron, which I kind of like. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And also, actually, when researching to chat to you tonight, um, interestingly enough, um, you've been able to kind of... You haven't courted the media, um, and it was quite hard to find out certain things about you. It's quite hard not to, is to keep away from the media and from the internet. So what I wanted to get, ask was, Norman, as a teenager, a young man, what is it... What did that look like for you? When did you start falling in love with music? Uh, I fell in love with music way before the teenage years. Yeah, OK. I think I was about eight, and um, the Osmonds came to town. The Osmonds? Uh, the Osmonds, yeah. Oh, fantastic. And it was like on the news and everything. And uh, basically, Donny Osmond had this piano with um, uh, little light bulbs on it that lit up when he played it. And he had his name in studs on his leather jacket. 
And I just thought, yeah. I, I want something. Oh, and it also had this little ribbon thing that when they played Crazy Horses, it went meow, meow. And eight-year-old me just thought, I, that's what I want to do in life. And so yeah. from eight years on, uh, old, uh, I just said to everybody, when they said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to be a pop star. Fantastic. Uh, by the time of my teenage years, I'd toned it down because um, punk rock had come out right. when I was like 14. And that really changed my view of... I didn't want to be a pop star anymore. I just wanted to be a, in a band. Yeah. And, um, but when yeah. did you buy your first record? Do you know what... And can you remember what it was? My first record was Devil Gate Drive by Susie Quattro. Oh, OK. I, I, oh, I sense a, a, a ripple of appreciation there. Yeah, that's um, a, bit, a bit of a better one, I think, for, for Susie Quattro. <laughs> yeah, so your first out, that was your first record. How old yeah. were you then? I don't know. I must have been about 11 or 12 to early 70s. Because but back then, people really listened to the records. You know, you'd sit... You'd, did you...? Like study, like listen to the whole. Oh yeah, thing I mean, start that, to finish, and it's interesting when you think with kids having streaming or all of us having stream nowadays. In those days, maybe you know there would have been a point in my life where I owned seven records. Mm. So me and every my parents and my brother and sister would know those seven records very, very well, and the B sides. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it, you just built up. But I was always a record collector. I was always, and that was how I became a DJ. Was because. I, I, I was sort of a vinyl yeah, you junkie. You had the best collection. Well, in those days, again, pre-streaming, if you were at a party and you want to hear good music, somebody had to possess those records and bring them. So I had a really good record collection. So people who hardly knew me would invite me to the party just so I bought my records. And one day, this girl invited me to a party and they said, she said, would you bring your records? And I said, well, actually, they always end up covered in vomit and cigarette ends and, and I kind of, I don't, don't want to bring them. And she was like, oh. And so she said, well, what if my dad hires these like double decks, like yeah. DJ console? And it sounded fun. And so we did that and I DJed. And I, something very fundamental happened that night. I yeah. really, really enjoyed sharing my favorite records with people and showing off a bit probably. And they seem to really enjoy that yeah, sort of thing. Yeah, listening to it. And yeah, because I never really thought I wanted to be a DJ, but it was, uh, yeah, something happened that night. But that happens, doesn't it? I got life? the bug. You, sometimes you just do something and you just go, oh man, this is what I'm meant to be doing. So when you, so how, how did you learn to DJ? Do you know what I, you know, I'm um, jumping right through my list here. We've missed, but uh, you know what I mean? I, I initially learned from my naughty uncle Dennis. Right. My, my Uncle Dennis was uh, a DJ and he'd been in bands and he drank and he swore and he was the funnest person in my family. That sounds fantastic. Yeah, and so um, he, when, when I signed, got the, the DJ bug, he sort of showed me the ropes. The way. And, yeah, and um, bought me... He didn't buy me my first set of decks, but he showed me how to get a mixer and two decks and, and how he worked. Yeah, how to start. And so, yeah, so my Uncle Dennis, he was the, he was the initial one. And then... What did your mum and dad think about the whole music thing? Not keen. Not keen? Not keen. No. No. Especially my dad. My dad saw it as slightly below prostitution in terms yeah, of... Yeah, OK. ...respectful jobs. <laughs> um, and, and worse paid in his mind as well. I know. Little did he know. So yeah, no, my. Uh, but that was it. That was a really. That was a great. A very. Um, it spurred me on a lot, especially being a kind of teenage punk rocker. The fact that my dad hated the music that I liked, that kind of made, made you it want to do it, more. it for me. And yeah, and 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 yeah. So one of the main my, something that's carried me was always wanting to prove my dad wrong and go, I can do this, and it is worthwhile career, and yeah, I can make a living out of it. Stuff like that. I know. So, um, yeah, so that was the sort of negative encouragement from, yeah. my, uh, from my dad. And, and did, did, he get, did he get that? That you, you, it's a success, it's fine, and it's not, prost it's not it's, you know, one lower than a prostitute or higher? No. I it, uh, sort of latterly, I kind of stuck it to him. Yeah. And, you know, I, th Said, I remember come coming... on, give me a break. I, I remember coming home for Christmas one year, and I had a BMW... And he kind of went, oh, nice car. Wh whose is that? And I went, mine. He went, where'd you get the money for that? And I was like, well, you know this kind of pop career thing, you know, like... It's going quite yeah, well. It's, I have I've been on top of the pops and stuff like that. And he, but he, 
he honestly didn't think that you made the kind of money from, you know, like being in the top ten. He didn't think that would buy you a car. Well, he, I suppose if he didn't know anything about it, you know, you know, he didn't know, he didn't yeah. know, you know, did. But, um, yeah, no, I, mean, he's, I think he's grudgingly now accepted the fact that I'm not a complete failure. No. And <laughs> Glad I, to hear it. I sort of insisted that he came to the uh, the Big Beach Boutique too, where we had quite a lot of people on the beach to see me, just to go, Dad, look, this is this is how it turned out. So there was a yeah, I mean, there's a little. Was that bit the of first? Was that the first big gig he'd been to? I think that was the first time he'd seen me. Yeah, he'd seen me. DJ. He must have been just must have been blown away, but grudgingly, stubborn. grudgingly admiring, yes. Yeah. So what was the first instrument you picked up? So. The first, it was probably guitar. Yeah. Just uh, like a, I'd done an acoustic guitar and trying to play punk rock records on it. And how old would how old would you have been? That's then? like sort of thirteen, fourteen. But around that time, actually no, I, by then I was having piano lessons. Okay. I had piano lessons all the way through school and did grade five piano. And in my head, it was like, well, this is going to help me to one day have a piano with the lights that light up and the naming yeah. studs on the back. So, <laughs> but it's not the most rock and roll instrument. So, but that was the, that's the only instrument that I've actually officially learned, apart from one term learning violin with Keir Starmer. Wow. Okay. I shit you not. I just thought. Ellie, is he lying? Did you like that little name drop there? No. You're going to help me out here when you not think you're telling a fib or not. I'm asking Nelly. Is that true or false? Do you know? Not sure. Okay. Is it true? It's true. It's true. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, I, 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 I've actually heard from somebody that you're incredibly musical, actually, and you you can kind of pick any instrument up and you're pretty good with it. I'd, pff, no, you I'm are. They no, say I'm, I'm, a, I'm a jack of all trades and a master of none. Okay. I, can, I can play a few instruments badly or well enough to, you know, kind of get by. But I'm not actually very good at any one instrument. Yeah. Which I suppose is why I ended up as a, as a producer and <laughs> now as a DJ, not playing any of them at all. Yeah. But uh, no, I've never really concentrated on one. It was always about... But that was the kind of the punk rock ethos. Yeah. Which the, you don't have to be, you know, classically trained. Here's a guitar, here's a drum kit, now form a band. It's and great I still, fun, isn't it? I still got I that kind bands. of attitude to it. Yeah. And so then, well, not then, but then you, you were the bass player for the House Martins. So how did that come about? Because are they based in Hull? Or did they...? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a long and convoluted story. Um, when I was at school, I knew a guy called Paul Heaton, who was from Sheffield, but he'd moved down to Surrey, where I was living. And we were just in a band when we were in, like, in the sixth form and stuff. Is that Rygate? Yeah, in Rygate. We were in a band called the Stomping Pond Frogs. <laughs> and uh, which was, which was quite, sim quite similar to the house yeah. minds. And then <laughs> when I moved down to Brighton to go to college and the drummer went to RADA and Paul got, oh. a, Paul got a bit upset that we'd all sort of disbanded the band and, and gone off. So he moved up to Hull, but I kept in touch with him. And then when I finished college down here, I rejoined him in Hull. So Okay. So you, ha so in the so you had lived in Brighton before because I couldn't... Yeah. I wanted to ask that, because that, is that where you kind of fell in love with Brighton? Yeah, I came down here to go to college when I was 18. So I was here from 18 to 21. Then I moved up to Hull to be in the House Martins for three years, and then I moved back to Brighton. Okay, when the band disbanded. Yes. Fantastic. And so your, so your love for Dutch, it's all jumpy about, isn't it? But it's really, I'm really interested to know. So your house for, your love for dance music started after the house mark no because you've been djing before you've yeah. been djing at college is that when you were taking your records to yeah parties? when i when i d so i've been djing as a hobby yeah and playing pop bands because i was in a pop band with paul i'd fail my air levels <laughs> so <laughs> and uh so i retook my a levels at evening classes and thought but so then i thought if i'm going to come down here and be and, and, and t do a degree. If I get in a band, I'll probably just give up halfway through the degree. So I forbade myself from being in a band for the three years I was doing the degree. That's very... 
Well, it was just disciplined. Self-preservation. Yeah. And so the DJing thing really took off. And obviously Brighton has got a, such a rich array of nightclubs. And, yeah. And, you know, I'm 18, 19 years old and the pleasures of the dance and wine, women and song in the nightclubs yeah. sort of carried me away. So, it, yeah, I mean, but in those days, you see, DJing was a hobby, not a career. Because DJs didn't get paid, you got paid like 20 quid a night. Yeah. We were interchangeable. We were just the guys in the corner who played records. So it was never really a career move. It was just something to do. Yeah. Uh, um, and am I right that in um, you started kind of making music to fill gaps in your set? That came later. Right, I mean, basically, OK. So for three years, I DJed when I was here. And yeah. then joined the House Martins and started playing in a band again. But, and so the DJing went back to being a hobby. But uh, it was, it was kind of I've, the, the house minds music was never really what I the kind of music no, I, I loved. I I always loved black music. I loved soul music yeah. and funk and and hip hop. And but I kind of in those days I sort of felt my as, as a white suburban you know English kid. You know you can't play black music. And so for years I just kind of thought my legacy would be to play white English pop, but I really like funk music. Yeah. And then something very fundamental happened, which is they invented the drum machine and the sampler. And with a drum machine and a sampler, you can just make your own beats and you don't have to pretend to, you don't have to play slap bass or put in an American accent or pretend that you're black or American. No. And that just opened, for kids like me, it opened a, a, a kind of uh, a route into making dance music. Yeah, brilliant. And so you're also in the Guinness World Records for having the most top 40 hits under different names. So I'm going to read a few out to you. The, the Schizophrenic Award. And, ju <laughs> <laughs> and just to clarify to people listening and watching this evening, I'm, I promise you I haven't made these up. Could I just uh, give a caveat yes. that you haven't made these up, but somebody might have made some of these up? Because if you got these off Wikipedia... Then I can promise well, you. I'm, I'm going to ask you, and you'll go no. A lot of them I've never heard in my whole life. Somebody, somebody, somebody with a sense of humour put a whole load of them on Wikipedia because okay. a lot of them aren't me. All right, so, so I've, do, like, true I've or only false? got four. Okay, oh, right, true, okay. True or false? I didn't list them to reams. Okay, so true or false, please, Norman. Margaret Scratcher. False. <laughs> would, would I ever call myself Margaret Scratcher? Well, I don't fucking know. Drunk soul brother. The drunk soul brother I have occasionally DJ'd under, yes. Okay. I Son can't of a think where that moniker, why that would <laughs> oi, oi. apply to me. Son of a cheeky boy. Son of cheeky boy was me. And only stomp, stomping pom frogs, that was you, wasn't it? The stomping pom frogs, yeah, yeah. So and then I put where these all you. Um, so when you release music under different names, was it because you were having just an absolute just laugh, or were you trying something different out under each different name, like a different sound, or to see if it? It was a bit of both of those things, yeah. but it was also sort of contractually I could make records for different record companies. It was it was more. Oh, okay. I mean, a lot of it was just because I was I was in a very prolific mode at that point, and so, so would you be in recording studio? So you just. Would you go there on was, one and disappear? There was a lot of shit coming out. Yeah, you were head. busy and, head. And not all of it was the same. Some of it was kind of slightly more housey. Or, so it just it allowed me to make more records and have more than one record at a time with, in slightly different genres. Yeah. And, um, yeah. and in those days, pre-internet, you could have all these different alter egos and no one ever knew that they were you. No. You were, it was quite ha easy just to make up a name, Interesting press, press that up you a record. As long as you didn't do interviews or have your photo taken, then no one really, really kind of cared who, who was No, and that's it. why, actually, it's quite hard to find some of this stuff out. Do you know what I mean? Because it's, I suppose, and some of it was a Some of it was deliberate. I mean, going back, like I said, in those days, dance music had predominantly been black music. And there was a kind of sort of a, a um, cynicism about white people making black music. So a lot of the time you would go under a pseudonym so people didn't know you were white. Yeah. Because they, they wouldn't take you quite so seriously if they knew you were white. So there was, there was all kinds of things and you could have a lot of fun with it. Yeah, with people not knowing who, yeah. 
who you yeah no I can actually yeah totally see that no and they I, don't judge there was it there's no IP address that they could look up no <laughs> And so you have collected records from all over the world, including Brighton record shops. Um, what do you look for to a, like a lay person like me? What are you looking for? Do you firstly look at the album cover and think, oh, I think that might be cool and just get it and have a listen? Or do you? It depends what kind of record I'm looking for. Because for me, in my job, yeah. I'll be looking for records to play in my DJ set. Mm hmm I'd be looking for records to sample, to make records out of. Uh, and then me as a person, I'd be looking for records that didn't sound any like, anything like what I did for a job. So yeah. the music I listen to at home is very, very different to, to, to work music. OK, well, so what are you listening to at the moment? I That's listen to a lot of Beatles, a mm. lot of um, really old, scratchy blues records and, mm. and soul records. Um, Anything that doesn't sound like what I do for a living. Yeah. The thing is, the thing is, my my enjoyment of music, I it, it's so completely fundamental to me. But the one thing I found was when I did it for a living, when you hear somebody else's record in the same kind of field as you. So if I hear one of my kind of peers make a really good record, instead of enjoying it, I just go, shit, why didn't I think of that? Yeah, a noise. Or <laughs> how can I use that idea? And you know, that, that was a really good kick drum. I use that. And so you just you start to appreciate music professionally. Yeah. And when you're doing that, then you haven't got that innocent, absolute love of the music yeah, anymore. Yeah, freshness it's of it. It's become like a job. So for my own personal pleasure, the music that I listen to at home is, is, is completely different to what I do for a job. Yeah. And that way I can still have that innocent enjoyment of it. Yeah, totally. And um, when you started... Um doing dance music who who did you who did you aspire to be then do you know what i mean who were your when i f very yeah. first started doing it i was i wanted to be halfway between grandmaster flash and probably big audio dynamite or yeah. the clash in their last years yeah that kind of uh punk um diy sampling thing but um, as, as a DJ, Grandmaster Flash was a huge inspiration. I saw him supporting The Clash and uh, I just was tr transfixed about what he was doing, scratching and mixing records. And, and when, was, when was that, roughly? So about 81, maybe. Yeah. And, and was he the first to kind of do the scratchy? He was the first time scratchy? I saw a, 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 you know, a scratchy. Or, a scratch, or a, a, not just scratching, but just mixing, chopping between one record and another and just using little snatches of records. Yeah, and making I, it smooth. I, yeah, and, and DJing as a, as a kind of creative art form yeah. rather than the guy in the corner who just has got a good record collection and will play them one after the other. Oh, totally, yeah. Practice. Uh, yeah, and just, the thought of just, just mixing. It's kind of... It's hard to explain in, in yeah, this day and age because there's machines that can do it very, very easily and there's a button now you can press called the sync button, which oh. just syncs everything up. So people but aren't in those days, it was like, how on earth do I get that to go at the same speed as that? And winding it with your, winding the spindle with your finger, and then getting these very speed decks. So it was a, it was very different art, but it was something that you did have to practice a lot. And you did it ever go wrong? Oh, ov yeah, obviously. Yeah. Obviously. Well, not obviously. Maybe no. <laughs> yeah. Obviously. Well, when I'm DJ now, I always clunk at least one mix a night. Just to so people know I'm doing it live. <laughs> That's quite a good idea, isn't it? <laughs> when I, yeah, I always get one slightly wrong and I just go, yeah, I meant to do that. <laughs> just so you, just, you know it's me doing it. No, I mean, it's, it's, um, it's funny, the mixing thing, because it, it kind of went so crazy where you get turntablists who are doing the most incredible things. That, are, But for me, it's always been about keeping the party going and just telling, going on a journey in yeah. the music and just making it tell a story that makes sense and fits yes and for totally pe for people who are dancing just to, to, to kind of go with you rather than trying to impress people you're just trying to take them on a, on a, on a journey yeah a an, an experience yeah which so i've so seen it's not so much showing off it's just leading them yeah leading the way for them yeah it's like the show it's like the whole from the start which i, what I was said earlier witnessing having watched so many of your gigs I really wish I'd been at them all. They're just incredible. 
just how you read the room and the, well, how you read the audience and the situation, you kind of, you lift it higher and higher and, you know, it's extraordinary. It's, it's, a, it's a very deep joy. It's a very deep oh, joy. Oh, must it's, be. It's probably the reason why I'm still so loving doing it, even at, at my age now, when I really yeah. ought to know better. Because it's something, <laughs> there's something really beautiful that happens when the whole crowd connects. Oh, my it goodness. It becomes just this big organism that's bigger than some of the parts. And, and it's kind of fueled by the, the flashing lights and the music and possibly alcohol. But it becomes, it comes this big seething mass of, it's of human amazing, edu energy yeah. and euphoria and joy and a sense of community and togetherness. And, and it's a very powerful thing to, and I'm very privileged to be there kind of, you know, edging it on its way. Yeah. And, um, and that is, a, yeah, I mean, that's, a, like I said, I've been very lucky to be able to do that. And, and, and that's the reason why I'm, I'm still here. As a, a very, a journalist friend of mine once described me as a shepherd of moments. And yes. I, I really like that. It is, it's just, I just take what's going on. I take the, the records and I just try and shape them into a, a flock that's, that's kind of going. Are having the most brilliant time. Yeah, it's, I've 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 blown away by watching all the footage from Red Rock to um, Glastonbury. You know, I was just watching, going, man, a mate. I mean, what does that feel like? It feels fabulous. It does it feel really fabulous. Is. Today's podcast is proudly supporting Martlets, the Brighton and Hove charity that provides life-changing hospice care for the city and beyond. Martlets is there during the toughest of times helping local people affected by terminal illness to make the most of the precious time they have and supporting family and friends through dying, death and bereavement. It is only able to do this thanks to the support of the local community and their friends and families across the UK and beyond. Norman Cook is a proud ambassador of Martlets. Please, do whatever you can to help keep Martlets caring. Visit martlets.org.uk. That's M A R T L E T S.org.uk. Or find them on social media at Martlet Hospice. Thank you. So, <laughs> moving smoothly into. So, Again, to a lay person like me, so when you're, you, I'm, just, I'm still talking about making music. Um, when you've got records and you listen, do you listen, you buy records to listen and you'd listen and then you'd hear a sample that you'd want? Yeah. Then what did you do? Uh, well, basically, I, 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 you just sort of trawl through secondhand record shops looking for interesting looking records. But you know, you just take little snatches like a, a, a drum break or just one snare sound, or a little guitar riff, or a little vocal sample. And you just, it's like a, a collage. Yeah. You just stick them all together and, and, and sort of glue them back together in a different way. And you wrote it all down. Sense? Yeah, it does actually. It's quite clear that's, and you wrote it all down, you wrote everything down. Did, you, have you, did I hear you say that in a podcast? Cast? Yeah, I, I, I got all these notebooks. In the old days, it, you kind of had to try and remember where everything was. Yeah. So was, again, in, in, in the modern world, everything's in files on your desktop. But in those days, it was, you had tons of records. So you had to remember where in the album that little drum break was. So I had all these notebooks. And I'm quite sort of OCD about record collecting and sound collecting. And, and so have you backed that up? I, yeah, I mean, I've still got all the records. I've still got the vinyl, like a room full of it. And then I've got a load of floppy disks. Yeah. <laughs> a floppy. Everyone loves got, a floppy disk. I've got my disc. whole floppy disk collection. Yeah. Uh, but nowadays everything is just on files in a laptop. Yeah. And do so. You've got a studio in your home in Hove. Yep. Do you go in now and it's twiddle Port the? It's Port Slade, not? actually. It's what? Port Slade, actually. Oh. Or or Puerto Slade, as we call it. Puerto Slade. Uh, okay, I stand corrected. You have a studio in Porto Slade. Yes. Um, do you go and twizzle the knobs still? No, no. Um, I, I kind of um, fell out of love 
with yeah. making making music, with producing and being an artist, about I don't know ten. 10 or 12 years ago. Yeah. And it had always been my passion. And it, it, like I said, I used to be absolutely prolific. And then I just kind of fell out of love with making music. Um, and obviously you can't make music unless you're, even if you're really passionate and you put your whole heart into it, it still doesn't guarantee success. No. So if you're not really that fussed about it, I thought better not do it. But in the meantime, the DJing side of it, I have got an absolute passion about. Yeah. And I love that even more. So the last 10 years, I've kind of been more of a DJ than a producer or an artist. Yeah. I've made, what, two records in 10 years. So I know I don't twiddle the knobs. Well, I twiddle different knobs these days. OK. Just as long as you are still twizzling something. Um, oh, the knobs are getting twiddled, fee not. No, no, no. Nelly's really not impressed with this conversation, mate. We have this thing, the appropriate, inappropriate dad here. If, when dad says something inappropriate, I get hit in the head. Yeah, that's fine. Just keep us on track, Nelly. I suddenly saw his lies going, nah. Um, I also wanted to just uh, talk about, I'm sure you've spoken loads about this before, but the Christopher Walken... Uh, a video. How did that come about? That was nothing, for weapon to, nothing to do with me. I'd worked with Spike Jones yeah. uh, on the Praise You video and, and we'd sort of become pals and he just rung me up one night and he said, I'm having dinner with Christopher Walken and he keeps dropping hints about getting his dancing down on tape while he's still young enough to do it. Do you want him tap oh dancing in your next video? And I just said, yeah. I mean, it was... Um, um, yeah, it was so it I'm was all Spike and Christopher's idea and then... I was supposed to be uh, do a cameo in the video. I was supposed to be like the bus boy at the beginning yeah. doing the hoovering. But um, my darling wife, Zoe, decided yeah. to give birth to our first child that weekend. Oh, dear. So I figured I should st stick around for that. So I, d I didn't get to the filming of it. So I, I know, I, I, I mean, Spike, it was Spike's idea. He scripted it. He storyboarded it. Christopher did that fabulous Oh, my God, genius. And I never even met Christopher until kind of awards ceremonies later when... I was taking all the credit for it. Great mover, though, isn't it? I mean, it just it's yeah, like I classic mean, Fred Astaire I mean, kind of. I've had a lot of luck in my career, and, yeah. and one of the one of the great things was meeting Spike and yeah. him reinventing how we made videos. Because I mean, I, I was never very comfortable about videos where you have to stand there and you're in them and you have to look kind of trying to look young and groovy and you know or, or you're forced well it's or, forced isn't it yeah. it's not or natural just, sort of dancing girls with big tits or something you know it's, it's yeah so, it, it just got to a point yeah thanks nelly it had got to the point in it sort of at the end of the 80s where all the good videos have been made but then spike just reinvigorated my sort of love of of, of using the, the medium of, of a pop video, not just as a kind of a, an advert for the song. Yeah. Like, hi, hey, well, our song is really good. It's like, let's go sideways and be stupid and make you laugh or break. Yeah, absolutely, break do something the different, rule. break yeah. the rules. Yeah. And I, I, I really enjoyed that. And, and at a time when MTV would break you worldwide, we were making videos that, that MTV loved and that really, really helped my career a lot. So yeah. it's quite, Spike and, and Roman Coppola and all the other directors, great directors that I worked with, they kind of... Yeah, their visions were right. They were on yeah. track with you, weren't they? So when you're, when you're DJing, is there a fa if you've got a favourite track that you like, is, is there anything that you really love playing? Um, not especially, no. Can you make me, one up for this evening, just for oh, my yeah. podcast? Thank you. <laughs> no, I'm, no well, I'm joking, I'm joking. I could tell you the most recent one, but it, but you won't like it. Won't I? I was I was playing a Martlet's Halloween ball at the Grand Hotel on Saturday night, and I was thinking if I'm having a really good night, I'll get to Dancing Queen by ABBA. Because yeah. Not a remix of it, not like a bootleg or anything like that. I I just genuinely love that record, but in my general in my normal career, if I played that record, I would get lynched. Yeah. So. For me, a really good show is if I get to play Dancing Queen at the end. OK, good. Have you seen the hologram show of ABBA? Not yet. Not yet, it's, but we It's got to. to be done. Yeah, it looks incredible. Um, has everyone heard about this in the audience? A anyone been to see it? No, it's, I think it's one to see. You're in the room with ABBA. Anyway, moving swiftly on. <laughs> um, so I've heard also you speak about Fat Boy Slim is something of an alter ego. 
and that Norman Cook is actually a pretty different guy. Yeah. Can you explain the differences? Well, yeah, when I started, Fatboy Slim was just kind of an, another name to use. But then, obviously, because it's just me, it's not a band or anything. It's sort of an extension of me. But I kind of learned that Fatboy Slim is an irresponsible lunatic. Yeah. And I can't inhabit that skin the whole time, especially no. when I had kids and things. And yeah. So, basically, what you've got now is Norman Cook, who's in his late 50s, a responsible father of two, and, uh, you know... Does a lot of charity, you know. And um, so when I have to go on stage as Fatboy Slim, I have to abandon all those kind of principles and morals and scruples that I have. Yeah. And turn into this kind of party lunatic with a mental age of about 17. <laughs> and so I literally do. I kind of, I, I've got a, a, a way of doing it. I put the Hawaiian shirt on. I take my shoes off. Yeah. For some reason, if I look down, I haven't got shoes on. I know I'm Fatboy Slim, not Norman. And that wow. means I don't have to take anything seriously. I don't have to be Yeah, it reminds you. I have no children, you know, for, for the next two hours. No, I have yeah, no Nelly children. again's not happy with that. I, I, li um, I listen to the podcast. But, but so the most yeah, important yeah. thing is that when I finish the show, I put Fatboy Slim back in the box. And then I have got children and I have got responsibilities. Yeah. Because there, there was times in my life, base, maybe when I... The, that the, went... The boundaries were blurred, but... These days, I have to know, you know, and it's, uh, yeah, so Fatboy Slim's kind of a character that I literally get out of the box for when I'm on stage. And yeah. at the end of the show, I put him back in the box, I put my shoes back on. Yeah. And because, in a way, a lot of the podcasts that in conversation with is about speaking to amazing, inspirational human beings, and you are one of them, is a balance about everybody in life is trying to find a balance. And sometimes you go a bit too far to the right, and you have to kind of rein it in and bring it back. So, I and mean, when watching your, the shows and the gigs and, and the euphoria, kind of euphoria that happens and lifting and I'm so jealous I really wasn't at all of them. Um, how long does it take you to calm down afterwards? I mean, you must come off buzzing. Not, not long. Not long. Not long. Um, I mean, a lot of the time it's quite late at night for a yeah. man of my age. Um, if I've had a really, if I've it's, had a really yeah. good gig, I am spent. You know, yeah. by the end of it, I'll have given every shred of energy I've got. So there's a, there's a certain amount of adrenaline, but that wears off after about ten or fifteen minutes, and then all of a sudden I'm like, Ugh, can I go? Wow, now, that's please? quite impressive. Which is yeah. good because yeah. in the old days I would keep carry going. On. I would party on. Yeah. So No, it, it, it's um, yeah. I, I, about fifteen minutes off the show, when the adrenaline wears off, I suddenly remember how old I am what time of night it is and yeah. reality comes back and yeah. that means it's bedtime um, and and slippers on um when you um when you kind of thought no come on rein it in find some balance here how, did it did it how long did it take you to adjust to going on stage and clicking into fatboy slim well things came things came to a head about 13 years ago, yeah. and uh, I decided I had to get sober. Yeah. So I got sober, and it was really scary to go on stage because I'd, I'd you know, DJing to a nightclub full of people, they're all drunk, so you being drunk seems really natural, and it, it would be unprofessional of me to go on stage sober because I wouldn't be in the same frame as mind as, as the people in the crowd. So I'd kind of lived in that world and that bubble so going on stage sober was really weird it was just yeah. like suddenly going on naked with the lights on you know really bright and thinking god this is real you know this yeah. isn't just the, some pie and it and but it didn't take me that long it didn't take no. me that long to work out a that there was enough residual partiness in my head that i that i knew what was going on there but also that i could uh that i was probably a better entertainer yeah um when i was sober yeah and and just in terms of my self-preservation it's, it's a good thing so yeah so i've, I've been totally and, and i can i can imagine that what you're getting from the crowd i mean the energy is you can go with it i, I i'll be honest i get kind of intoxicated yes. I mean, it's such an insight exciting thing to do there's so much adrenaline going through you there's so much warmth you're feeling from the audience there's so much 
um, excitement that you're feeling for the audience. And there's quite a funny thing. I, I love monitoring some of the social media things where there's a, there's a film of me DJing and, and then somebody goes, that Norman, he's, he's supposed to be sober, but look at him, he's off his nut. And then there'll be a, a discussion of what drugs I might have had or how much it looks like. And I'm, all the time no. I am actually sober, but I do, I kind of go into a, a, a state of some kind of intoxication yeah. in the moment, and um, which looks like I'm drunk and feels like I'm drunk, but it's great because I'm not. No, and when exactly. I come stage, I'm and the next morning, you're just fresh as a daisy. Yeah. No, wonderful, brilliant. And so, you're, so you are a father of two. Yes. Woody, 22, and lovely Nelly. You're tw are you 12? Who's 12? And so they're both ta taking up DJing, haven't they? Yeah. And I, I saw you in lockdown, Nelly. I, I watched. You're Do good. You're very see good. See girl, Slim. She's very good. <laughs> the, only thing, the only thing I can say about this is yeah. that it, I, I, we haven't pushed either no. our children into showbiz. But obviously, me growing up with me and Zoe as parents, they're just it's in your kind genes. of show, showbiz or showing off or music, or it's just kind of in their blood. So it's not a kind of a career move. I feel it's just kind of nature and nurture that you're going to end up. Well, it's in their ge it's in your genes, isn't it? Well, it's in their genes, but also that's all they've ever known. Growing up, all they had was me and Zoe and all our friends just showing off all the time. So it's kind of for them. That's yeah. what we do, isn't it? Do they show off all the time? Okay. Well, I kind of grew up in that genre, so I, I do understand. I yeah. I'm sh yeah, showing off. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so do you have the decks up all the time in the ha at home? No. No, do no. you just pull them out, for, like when Nelly did her lockdown gigs? They came out during lockdown, yeah. Normally they're sort of in my office and not necessarily even plugged in. Um, but and do they ask for your advice? And do you ask Dad's advice on the DJing, or have you picked it up by watching? Uh, oh, oh, hello. This is cool. Um, well, it was sort of like I sort of just copied his stage presence. Like, yeah. Like everything he did, I sort of just copied. Like all the actions and all like the like the way he did all the dub and everything. But then. It was quite weird to start learning, but then it was really easy once you like yeah. know what everything is. It's not rocket science, is it? No, it's not. It's quite hard at the Norman's beginning. saying it's not rocket science, it is to me. Um, and, and, and also, I'm having a menopausal moment. Totally forgot what I was going to say. So I don't worry, this bit will be edited out. No, that yeah, can be edited out. Um, or we can keep it in because the menopause is real. Um, <laughs> I was like, Nelly, I was talking about your lockdown gigs in the kitchen. And I might come back to it. Um, it was brilliant anyway, watching you. Um, and also talking about the lockdown. So you might not recognize me actually, Norma, but we have met most probably about 30 other times. Normally I'd be wearing my pajamas or a tracksuit and with a Russian hat and you served me chai in lockdown. And you gave my black Labrador my cocker spaniel sausages. I mean, how all amazing dogs, is your all dad? All the dogs get free sausages. Oh, yeah. Occasionally I'd say no, he's on a diet. Um, I'd still slip him one when you weren't looking. Yeah. <laughs> Thank God. Um, anyway, moving. No, but honestly, thank you for all my chais in lockdown. That was epic. Did you enjoy working in the cafe? Yeah, it was. It was kind of my salvation. Yeah. Because uh, I, you know, obviously, all of us had different experiences of lockdown and where where it took mm. us and, and and how you dealt with it. And when I wasn't dealing with it, at first, I kind of had all the kids with me and during the summer. But in the autumn. Woody went off to university and yeah. he was back in school during the day and I still wasn't back at work. And I, I was beginning to get to me. Yeah. And then, so I started working in the cafe. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, this is what I need. Just being able to talk to people and feel connected to the outside world. Yeah. And we were kind of lucky that we could stay open as a takeaway. Yeah. And yeah, so I worked there for seven months. And, and yeah. I really, really enjoyed it. I just, I mean, it was... It, it kind of gave me a purpose in life when I had none. It gave yeah. me something to do. I mean, and, and also, it's, I kind of 
grounded my relationship with everyone around. No, it was, it was lovely. It took and it took that whole feeling of community in the cafe to a next level for me. Uh, but also, I mean, and but also, it was quite surreal as well. Yes, it it's was quite, surreal. I did get a certain pleasure out of looking at people's faces in the double takes I do I, when I'm serving them coffee. Yeah, they, everyone was going, um, is that, is that not, no. Do you know, do you know my favourite, my favourite quote out of that was some guy and I was serving him and he, he looked at me and went, you really look like Fat Boy Slim. <laughs> so, so I said, oh, there's a reason for that. He went, I get it. Fat Boy Slim only employs people who look like him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but no, the, um, the, the, the most famous comment was like, has it come to this? Has it come to has, this? Has it come to this? That was my... So uh, while Nelly's sitting here, so being a parent, and I'm a parent as well, we want to kind of protect our children with every fibre in our being. So being in the public eye isn't easy, and it's not easy seeing one's children in the public eye either. So do you... Do you have chats with your kids about how do you prepare them for it? What and how do you prepare yourself for it? You know what? When when my firstborn Woody was growing up, we we were fiercely defensive about him because Zoe and I signed up for this life, and yeah. and you know, and if you if you caught celebrity or court success then you can't moan when it kind of rebounds on you so we would have sort of tabloid attention and everything but we were always like leave the kids out of it they're, they're innocent you know they're civilians and so for 18 years we completely protected Woody we made sure he was pixelated anytime he was in a magazine and totally protected him Woody turns 18 what does he do <laughs> goes on the circle I'm reality TV show and shows him the whole self waltz and all for a month on the telly. So I think after that point I kind of gave up on the on the idea that yeah uh, that you can shield your children and as you can see from tonight I'm kind of not shy about Nelly seeing what I do you know what my job looks like and no, I think, yeah I'm yeah. not so protected and and you know and she, she's all she, Nettie's already a star in her own right, so that ship has yes, sailed. Yes, she is. <laughs> and in lockdown, am I am I correct in that you realise just how much you really love DJing and miss it? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, uh, we you, miss you too. It's there's it, it. It was really weird because all the way through we were kind of aware that this new thing called social distancing was the <gasps> absolute opposite of what I do for a job. It's like, so I, I, under no illusions that we would be the last thing to come back when the lockdown shut, when yeah. everybody we went back. So really had to take that on board. But I just didn't realise how much it's a part of me, what I do. It's not a job, it's my life, and it's kind of what I need to do. So kind of showing off in the cafe was kind of the, the closest I could get to being a performer. Yeah. And... Um, and, it, and it, uh, it wasn't so much I realised how much it defined me, it was realised how much I cherish it. Yeah. And having done it for most of my life, sometimes I might be a little bit blasé, but having it taken away from me for a year really made me appreciate the, how much I love my job and how lucky I am to have to be, still be doing it. And I made some kind of pact with whoever it is I believe in, saying, you know, give, if you give me this back, I, you know, I promise I'll never moan about it airport layover or a shit hotel ever again you know no so it was it was just just give us that thing back please well i think it i most probably did that for a lot of us it made us realize what's important to us and what we love and how lucky a lot of us are and, and also it made me realize quite what the, the place of the job that i do because we all you know we tried to to recreate it with doing streams and things like that but if you take the, the crowd experience and the connectivity and the sense of community, you take that out on a live stream and you've just got a middle-aged man playing records in his kitchen. And so I realised it's that coming together and then, you know, people would have Friday night kitchen discos and they, you know, they'd sort of be on a stream with their mates and play. And you could play the music really loud, but there's something about connecting with other yeah. people and uh, having a room full of people all enjoying the music. And and the, we need that as human beings. We yeah, need to live. commune yeah. and we need to, to 
escape and lose ourselves in a in a big crowd of, of like minded people. And, 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 and let go, yeah. let go. And, and dance music, especially, it's not dance music's role isn't to kind of entertain, uh, to, to, to educate or, or, or agitate people. It's there to help you forget your troubles, just switch them off and yep. go into this fantasy world. And and a lot of people really miss that. Yeah. And and the most fabulous thing about it is when we when we came back, every single gig, the atmosphere was like people were ready. Seventy five percent higher. You know, it was like kind of. The whole gig was like the minute that the clock struck 12 on New Year's Eve. Yeah. <laughs> Just hugging strangers and, yes, we need this. So, yeah, it made me realise how important dance music is for us to get out of ourselves and join a big community of, of, of yeah. nonsense and escape. And yeah, euphoria. definitely. We'll have a round of applause for that. Come on. You, you recently did the Big Beach Boutique festival back here in Brighton. Is it amazing Six. playing Brighton for you? Yeah. Yeah. I I mean, I I have a very special relationship with yeah. this city where I just love it so much and it seems to love me back. Really, and, yeah. And it really, I think, it just really suits me being here and, and, and doing stuff. And things like doing a big gig on the beach just is a celebration of that relationship for me. And it was 20 years anniversary from when you last played on... It was it's 20 years since we were last allowed on the pebbles. Yeah. We, d we did it twice on Madeira Drive and twice at the Amex. But yeah. But this first time they've actually let me back. And, and I don't know if it was coincidence or not, but it was 20 years since yeah. the really big one. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it, yeah I, I, I love my relationship with this city. And it's lovely just to have a big celebration party of you let yes. me do this. And, you know, yeah. And, and, it, and, it, and it is the, you know, it really, really warms my heart to think that, you know, this is kind of my hometown yeah. and that they're, they're proud of me. Yeah, very proud of you and love you very much. So also talking about the area, you do a lot for charity um, here in Brighton and Hove. And you've recently done Working With Heads Up, um, which is an NHS charity supporting people with severe mental health problems. And you did actually... In this a, very room? A, yeah, a DJ workshop in this very room. And well, well so that comes back to the power of music. Yeah, which I... Yeah. Oh, sorry. I no, no. I was, I was just going to say, the power of music is so powerful that I wanted to ask whether, be it playing music, producing, listening to, is it central to your well-being? Does music play a part? In your well-being, I th yeah, I think it does with yeah. everyone. I mm. think um, it just keeps you. I don't know. I mean, if you, I, I remember times of being down, and then you listen to a song, yeah, and you hear that the person who wrote that was more down than you, <laughs> yeah, and uh, you get some kind of solace in the fact it's like, okay, I'm fucked, but you're way more fucked than I am right now, yeah. and, and you got through it. And um, there is so this, from from that kind of sort of blues principle onwards, it's just it's a way of of uh, but also it's a very good way of distracting your brain. If you, there's stuff going around in your brain that's just not going anywhere and is not healthy, no, you can interrupt that unhealthy flow by music. Yeah, and that's one of the things I found doing the DJing workshops is you can just switch off that static or the negativity. Yeah, I walked I through actually when you were doing it and I saw a couple of the guys that you were teaching and they utterly loved it. They well, again, it just takes you out of yourself. Yeah. And if you're struggling with being in yourself, it's just a nice little escape. I find that really interesting when you're feeling low, you listen to down records. I try and listen to up records, not just I think it personal. Both, I think it cuts both ways. Yeah. 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 And then you also, so you work very closely with the Martlets too, um, which is a local charity that provides people with terminal illness the very best of end of life care and support. So how did you come about working closely with the Martlets? Uh, I lost my father-in-law and he spent his last few days in there and I was just kind of very touched about the, the care they gave him at the end of his life and and just the, the attitude to end of life care, which is something that normally, you, you know, you take a deep breath before talking about. But um, yeah, so it, it, that touched me. And then 
they asked me to do we um they just asked me to do odd things yeah and it just felt really right and it, again it's it's very much a, a bright you know it's a, a brighton thing it's not rolled out through the rest of the, the country no and and i just felt very comfortable doing it and after a, a couple of years of working with them they asked me to be an ambassador and yeah so yeah i'm just i'm just their bitch really <laughs> <laughs> and they're, they just wheel me out when they need, you know, yeah. c- c- celebrity coverage. But I'm, I'm happy with that. No, we have great... I mean, they're lovely No, it's people. a really important lovely thing, people, isn't it? And it really brings the community together. And, and, and people like Luke, who runs this place, has, been, has, has got involved with it too. So, yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's a nice thing, a very nice thing to be part of. And it, it, and it makes me feel good. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, and so recently... So, uh, uh, the amazing gigs you've done, Glastonbury, Coachella, Red Rock, um, the list goes on. Um, but I did watch the documentary about Woodstock. Oh, my. And somebody oh, in the audience also. said, do you dare? And I, my best mate actually said, I told her I was having a chat with you. And she said, you have got to watch this. I mean, what a nightmare. But you... It was one of the hairier nights of my life, yes. You know what, actually, I'll be honest with you. And I, I'm glad no one outside this room will hear it. It's not been broadcast or anything. It wasn't. It wasn't actually that bad. Wasn't it? Well, no. Did they make the documentary and just? Well, I, I, on the Saturday when I was there, there wasn't yeah. any of the violence or anything. I mean, there was a lot of very, very kind of drunk people misbehaving, but yeah. there wasn't that kind of undertone of violence. So I didn't. I was lucky that I didn't have to see the kind of the nasty bit. Thank I just goodness. saw just lunacy. Okay. Um, and yeah, it, it was, it, I, you know, it was, it, it's weird because we all forgot about it for 20 years until they made that film. Because most of the people who were there, it's like, kind of, they weren't everyone said, oh yeah, how was Woodstock? We're like, oh, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. But there was no kind of camera phones and social media in those days, so it kind of got buried. So it's quite interesting to it was quite re- interesting to relive it. Yeah. Also that, I mean, I don't know if any of you have seen it, that was during my drinking days. So I don't know if you noticed, I might possibly have been quite drunk during it. So I didn't remember that much. On that one, but not the new, not the Woodstock recently. No, what is it called Woodstock recently, if I got that totally wrong? Where they were pulling me and you got rushed out. Yeah, that happened 22 years ago. Was that 22 yeah. years ago? But they've just made a film about it. Oh! Thanks, Holly, for telling live. me that. I thought it was like recently. No, it's like 1999. We can edit. We can edit that out so I don't look stupid. Yeah. Or, Thanks. Okay. Or just leave it in. <laughs> <laughs> so I also thought it would be very rude for me not to mention Brighton and Hove Football Club. Yes. An avid supporter and shareholder. Yes. When did you adopt them as your team? Uh, not immediately when I moved down here, because I grew up very near another football team called Crystal Palace. And My dad supported them. You can't be rude. So uh, that's <laughs> where I, that was where I grew up. So when I first moved to Brighton, it felt a bit strange. But yeah. my my flatmate started taking me along to the matches, and I just fell in love with them. And it's it's been. I mean, it's like a lot of my journey with Brighton. It's been so, such fun to get involved in something local mm. and. We, I mean, it, it kind of, it, it started when we came back to the With Dean and um, Skint started supporting, uh, started being the shirt sponsor. Yeah. And going from being a fan to kind of being the shirt sponsor, you, you feel like you're part of the family and Dick Knight was running the club and it was all very funny. And then, yeah, from then on, my relationship with the club was just sort of snowballed. But it's just, I don't know, it's just, it's nice having a, 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 a local team that's so easy to love. Yeah. And that are always entertaining, whether it's ups or downs, it's never dull. And then to be part of that and to be able to, you know, be the shirt sponsor or... Um, I've still got a very strong relationship with the team. You know, things like launching the new home strip or the gig on the beach. Yeah. I love things like that. Yeah. And they kind of just cement my relationship with, with, with you know, with the, the city that I love and the football club that I love. Yeah, I mean... It- Brighton is a really very special city. I moved down here 13 years ago and knew no one. Knew, yeah, woo! I knew no one. And um, I got involved in Paddle Around the Pier. 
Um, I'm, I used to run the VIP area without spending one P. Um, and I just used to go to people and ask for things. And I just couldn't believe how friendly everybody was. And um, I adore it too, for its community. So living in Hove myself, I wanted to thank you for all that you've done for the community. Being at charity work, getting involved in planning in the area, big, big beach gigs or little pop-up ones, all of it is really appreciated. Thank you. And yes, come on. All of it, all of it has it been here. <laughs> and not forgetting the chais and the dog sausages. That's a personal thank you. So you are Brighton and Hove's treasure. And we all think we know you when we don't. So I thought it would be fun to end with a quick fire round, few questions, so we get to know you a little bit better. Okay. So, it is like Panto. <laughs> Behind you, what food could you absolutely not live without? Meat. <laughs> Sorry. No, we've got to be honest. Yeah. If you could only go on one holiday destination for the rest of your life, where would it be? Ibiza. Ne <laughs> Tea or coffee? Coffee. Favourite book? Uh, the Ragged Trousered Philanthropist. Could you say that again? <laughs> the Ragged Trousered Philanthropist. Favourite movie? Uh, the Big Lebowski. Yeah? What? Oh. Oh. I think you know the answer to that one, young man. Favourite season of the year? Summer. It's definitely summer. And last but not least, favourite song not written by you? Uh... Golden Slumbers by the Beatles. Fabulous. Thank you very much, Norman Cook. Well, thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Put your hands together for Norman. And Nelly. It was an absolute pleasure hosting Norman and Nelly. It was so lovely that she joined us. And what an honor it was to chat to such a legend of the music scene. Now, don't forget to let us know what you thought by rating and reviewing, please. And make sure to keep an eye out for upcoming episodes. Thank you.